Good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the honor of serving as director of Roosevelt House on behalf of Hunter President Ann Kirshner. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our very special program this evening, um, and also to welcome the chair of our board, Rita Hauser, who is here. And as you can tell from the size and the energy of the audience tonight, I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is a very special event because we have a magical combination on tap and on stage here. Adam Nagurney, Maggie Haberman, and of course a discussion of their home base, the New York Times. So I feel a deep kinship because I've written about the paper also, but 170 years ago, not the, not the current paper. I wrote about Henry Raymond and Lincoln. It's not quite the same thing. Um, but, but Adam, in, in producing this book, is kind of a successor to all of the books about the times over the generations. Augustus Maverick, um, Elmer Davis, Meyer Berger, Harrison Salisbury, David Halberstam, in a sense, Gay Talese, among others. And now we have Adam's remarkable uh, inside story of the 21st century paper, The Times, How the Newspaper of Records Survived Scandal, Scorn, and the Transformation of Journalism. And it's a, an extraordinary read. You all know I like to inject just a little bit of Roosevelt family connection. Um, so let me remind everyone of the relationship um, between the family, this house, and the paper. So when this house was serving as the transition headquarters for President-elect Roosevelt 91 years ago, the Times and other newspapers were hanging out on the street uh, below the steps where you came in. They were here day in and day out. They were here as demonstrators, walked by chanting, we want food, we want food. And in the winter, Eleanor felt sorry for the journalists because they were still on the steps, you know, icicles forming on their nose and eyes. And she invited them to camp out inside the parlor where you signed in. So for the next two and a half months, they were embedded inside Roosevelt House, photographers and reporters, tripods, flash bulbs, cigarettes, smoking, lots of smoking going on here. and. Um, on the day that of the election, <clears throat> the press was not inside, but Herbert Hoover did not concede. It seems to be a thing. He didn't concede. <laughs> he won nine states, but he didn't concede. So FDR gave a speech in front of the fireside on the second floor, in a sense his first fireside chat, and then repeated it for Fox Movie Tone News. There was actually a third iteration, because when the Times <coughs> found out that Roosevelt had spoken twice directly to the people without their covering, he came downstairs in his wheelchair and did a third performance of the speech for the press in, in, the, par in the parlor. So this long history exists uh, between the paper and, um, and FDR. Times did not endorse Roosevelt in 1940, just saying. We've forgiven them for the one lapse they had in the endorsement world. I'm just going to say one word also about Eleanor, because we're celebrating her in particular this year. It's the 75th anniversary of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, her greatest achievement. And in one of her last My Day columns in 1962, Eleanor devoted space to praising the Times for opposing a congressional initiative to ban books that were considered unpatriotic or unsuitable, right? Some things never change. So in words that could have been written yesterday, Eleanor insisted that Americans had the ability to read and reject ideas on their own and should always uh, be able to judge for themselves. So we're grateful that Eleanor spans time to ins instruct us. So tonight we're gonna find out more about the modern times, and it's a great personal pleasure to welcome for his first visit to this part of the building, um, journalist Adam Nagurney, whose career at the Times has included stints as 
West Coast cultural correspondent, LA bureau chief, and national political reporter. His previous book was Out for Good, A Definitive History of the LGBTQ Movement. And Adam, I'm not sure anybody could have predicted this reunion because it's only been 46 years since we met each other when you were covering the mayoral campaign of 1977. Um, and it's close to four decades since I spent my Mondays and Tuesdays pitching stories to you in behalf of uh, Governor Cuomo when you sat in the LCA room in Albany typing in your inimitable fashion. I'll do impersonations of that upstairs afterwards. <laughs> Serving as interlocutor this evening is a Roosevelt House favorite, New York Times correspondent and CNN commentator, Maggie Haberman. Um, Maggie, you're too young to have responded to my political press overtures, but back in the day, I did pitch some stories to your father. And um, <laughs> I know, I'm looking at him. And um, I did collaborate on a few um, PR campaigns with your mother, so there, there you go. Um, right. <laughs> More, there is, so there's kinship here, and more to the point, Maggie has twice served as the Jack Newfield lecturer here at Roosevelt House, most recently in celebration of her own recent book. So welcome back, Maggie. So tonight, for those watching from the auditorium and from one of our overflow rooms or at home on Zoom, the program will unfold as follows. Um, Adam and Maggie will talk for about 45 minutes. Then we'll open the floor for audience questions, for on-topic audience questions, um, for which we will ask you to wait for microphones uh, so our Zoom audience can hear and we can record you for our own website. Following the Q&A, we will adjourn to the Four Freedoms Room upstairs for a reception and book signing where you can purchase the book and get it inscribed. Also, just want to acknowledge Basil Smeichel is here, the head of our public policy program. <laughs> and I just saw our Eleanor Roosevelt leader in residence, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, who just joined us. <laughs> and with that, it's uh, time for the Times, and I'm happy to turn it over to Maggie Haberman and Adam Nagurney. Thank you, Harold, and thank you all for being here tonight to honor Adam um, and to hear about his book. Um, it's a little daunting to be interviewing somebody who was and is the dean of our political coverage at the New York Times. Um, Adam and I both come from New York tabloids. We also both uh, covered New York politics for a very long time, uh, and Adam is the the star of most of my favorite moments of reporters interviewing and sort of cornering politicians at various press conferences. Um, there have been more than more than I'll tell tonight, but he's uh, he's <laughs> he's always driven politicians crazy. Um, and here he has uh, put together a a remarkable uh, compendium of the paper's history over the last fifty or so years. Um, I want to take note of two things. Number one, uh, we are having this conversation at a moment of enormous global tumult. Uh, and the paper's resources are being put uh, in our online capacity and in the daily print uh, coverage to what is happening in Israel um, uh, and, and has been in Ukraine for some time. I also want to acknowledge, as Harold noted, we are both employees of the New York Times. And so that, that just is what it is. Um, we are going to answer questions, uh, but we're not here as ombudsmen for the paper. And uh, you know, there are things that we can talk about that we both covered or that are within our, our area of knowledge. But uh, uh, beyond that, I would ask you to, to, to keep, keep the questions that don't relate to those things uh, uh, on the sidelines. So with that, um, Adam, why this book? Why is this the book, of all of the books that you could have written, why is this the one you wanted to do? Uh, <clears throat> well, first, uh, thank you, Harold, for uh, inviting me here. Thank you, Maggie, for agreeing to be the questioner. Um, so um, I always wanted to work for the New York Times. Ever since I was a kid growing up in Westchester, I was in a New York Times family. It was always a big deal to me. And um, after I got here, 
I began thinking more and more that there was a need for a, a book about the times. Um, there have been some great ones written, particularly Gage Lisa's book that Harold referenced that I read when I was in college, I think, that really influenced me in terms of what I wanted to do with my life. But there had been, after that, there had been a book by Alex Jones and Susan Tiff, which was about the Sulzberger family. But no one had really, really sort of tried to capture, in, in my opinion, a really comprehensive, hopefully detached way, this paper that is such a huge influence in American journalism in American politics and in American society. And it it just seemed like a big target. And as I got, what's the word, older? Um, you know, the clock was ticking and I finally decided to do it. Um, I wanna talk about process, but before I get yep. to that, I, I have to ask a question that I know you've been asked before. Yeah. And it's a book tour, so you've been asked all the questions before. Um, but on this one, you still work for the paper. Mm -hmm. um, when Gay Talese wrote The Kingdom and the Power, he had quit the paper. That's correct. Um, how can people trust that you are doing uh, an objective assessment uh, of a place where you still work? Right, that's a really fair question. Let me make three points. Um, the book ends in 2016, the, the main narrative. There are, two na there are two reasons for that. One is that I think that the closer you get to the present, the less you are ab able to say smart, analytical things. You have no access to the kind of candor that I got from talking to people who are no longer at the paper, who had some distance in the paper, and I didn't have the, I wouldn't have the kind of access to papers that I, if you read this book, were so crucial to making this an in inside story about the paper. The other part of that was more practical, which is that um, I didn't want to be writing about people that I work with or work for. So with a few exceptions, I write about A.G. Solzberger, who is now the publisher, but I write about him in his early years there, and I write about him when he was involved in the innovation report, we can talk about it if you want, Talk about that if you want. And then I write about a managing editor named Carolyn Ryan, just as a, as a figure in some of the political coverage over the years. But mostly that was a very deliberate decision as a way to make it more easy to do what I wanted to do. I, I have to say to some extent, I, I think I accomplished, I accomplished that. The reviews for what they're worth, which of course I don't read. Um, <laughs> Read has, them in like a year. You don't yeah, have to do it right yeah, now. It's like I can't even wait that long. Have said that, I think I think the New York Times deserves the same kind of honesty and tough coverage that we bring to stories, people and stories that we write about. And that was my goal in writing about it. And I to some extent I have to ask people to tell me whether they or not they think I accomplished it. Talking uh, about the <clears throat> trove of documents you got, of notes, uh, of emails. How did you how did you do that? You had access to so much material that I was afraid you had access to my emails. I mean, it was really it's stunning how yeah, much I did. It, <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Um, but but how did you get people? A were you surprised at how much note taking there was from a lot of people historically who were yep. part of the the older era of the paper? Yep. Um, and, and how did you get them to agree to to turn these things over? They're not always flattering to the people involved. No, and I think th th there's three different parts of this. The first part was that the New York Times kept an archive, official archive, instructed its editors and key people at the paper to give their papers over that were stored, and you can go read them at the New York Public Library. It ends with the end of Max Frankel's term. So I, he's a managing, sorry, executive editor. So about 1992. Um, but beyond that, what I began doing is asking everyone in key positions who I met with, who were after this period, to let me have whatever papers they had. You know, journalists are, at least pre the in email, are pack rats, right? So, you know, I, I just go, go through some names. So I asked Joe Lelyveld, who was a big deal executive editor for a long time, and I repeatedly asked him, and then he finally just handed me boxes of documents. Same thing with Bill Keller, say, another executive editor. Same thing with Jill Abramson, and to a lesser extent with, with Howell Raines. And I think what it was with, Part of this is going to sound a little bit Pollyannish, so sorry. I think part of it is that these are journalists who really do believe in transparency to some extent, and to a certain extent were at least had decided to cooperate with this project, and that meant they understood the need for raw material. But I also think that these guys um, and women had thrown papers into boxes and forgot <laughs> what was there. So I would be going through some of them, and I'd come across something, and my eyes would just pop. and. <laughs> There was like, What's an example of that? What's something that, that stunned you that you found? They're all through the book, in my opinion, but for one example... I agree, but right, I'd like I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, one example of it was... Um, and this was something I just came across fortuitously in going through papers of uh, oral histories upstairs at the Times, 
was this email exchange between Arthur Sulzberger Jr., the publisher for most of this, and Barb Herbert, who I guess most people here know was a columnist at the paper, the paper's first, the paper's first black columnist. First type black columnist, in which Herbert ran into Arthur Sulzberger in the elevator, and Arthur basically just told him that it, he was <laughs> losing his column, right? Um, and it's startling, because Bob Herbert got understandably really upset, and it just said a lot about, for better and for worse, Arthur's management style. I think he decided that Herbert, I don't think I can tell you from reading the document, he, he thought that Herbert's column was not doing what he wanted to do, which was to write about New York slash urban affairs. Um, but then, you know, Herbert got really upset and fought back, and as a result, and we can kind of figure this out here, he was around for five more years. He threatened uh, litigation, and I think the Times um, was not ready to deal with that kind of litigation. He finally left on his own terms five years later. That's a, a good segue to going back in time. So the book begins with, <clears throat> with Abe Rosenthal's tenure. And, um, and he was a dominant figure in the life of the New York Times for a very long time, so I've been told. I, I was not around when he was there. Um, he was not the kind of editor who could exist at this point in time. I mean, one of the things that comes through in, in the book is there, there's an, an amazing description from Anna Quinlan describing him as, I think it was a holy shit editor, was, right. her, was her line, um, who would really make you want to go chase a story, was right. the context in which she meant that. But he was also someone who, when you uh, stumbled on a, a lot of interesting information about him, he was somebody who brought uh, prejudices of the era, I should note, mm -hmm. um, to the job, but nonetheless in a pretty pronounced fashion. Um, talk about that a little bit and, and what he meant to the paper because the way that he was always described to me over time was he steadied the place. And yet a lot of what comes through in the book is how roiling a presence he could be as well. You know, I think, I think that he was a, in many ways a great journalist, right? Like he had high standards for the paper. His, you know, he went one or two Pulitzers. He was just a great journalist. Um, but he would not be able to last more than six months at the New York Times or any company today. He was a bully. People were afraid of him. He was, I dare say, abusive. Um, I, what you're referring to, I came across, I, I wondered, people always talked about him as a homophobe. Um, there were some sort of famous episodes, including one where he recalled a, a man named Richard Meislin, uh, who was the Mexico bureau chief. Some of you might actually know him, uh, lived up here. Um, and everyone thought it was because he had found out Richard was gay, right? Um, which he was. And, um, but that was disputed, wasn't it, by other people? Wouldn't people who well, are Abe partisans push back on that? Yeah, right. Abe himself pushed back on it. Abe said that that was not why I brought him back. I brought him back because I didn't think he was doing a good job. I mean, I couldn't unravel that. There was no end to that. But I will say that Meisland's reputation was pretty high in the newsroom, so it's hard to believe that's why I brought him back. But again, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, it's, right? Like Maybe that was why. Except, right? what did so you I'm, find? Where I'm going through papers over at the New York Public Library, I came across um, his own personal papers, right? There's New York Times papers and his personal papers. And in it was a diary he was keeping because he was considering writing a memoir. Um, and in it, he talks about gays. And he says, and I'm not going to have the exact uh, site right, but this is basically what he said. I would hire a gay person to cover theater and the arts, of course, but I would never hire one to cover the White House or the State Department. The fact of the matter is that gay people form cliques, and cliques in the newsroom are dangerous. And I'm, I'm reading this and thinking, like, whoa, here's like the real kind of evidence of this, right? Then there was another thing I came across. There was a, um, a pretty well-known, at the time, probably some maybe older readers here, more, excuse me, more experienced readers here, <laughs> will remember a, a news editor named Al Siegel, who was a larger-than-life figure. Um, he was a news editor. He was the keeper of the standards of the paper. And he, um, he was very discreet. I, I went to interview him. If I could do a quick side story here. I went to interview him because I wanted to talk to him for the book, right? And we went and had lunch over in New Jersey, where I think he lived. Um, and he said he wasn't going to cooperate with me. Um, he didn't. I think the reason why, this is just my surmising it, was that he was getting older and he didn't trust his memory, but also he probably didn't want to refight all these old battles. But there turned out to be a third reason. Um, I was going through uh, papers that the Times official historian had kept, right? And in them, in those, were six or seven hour-long oral histories that he had given at the time contemporaneously with the condition they not be released until after he left the paper and Abe Rosenthal left the paper. And they were just eye-opening. And one of the things he talked about, he talked about a lot of stuff. He talked about how much he, 
he hated Abe Rosenthal, how conflicted he was about him, because as I said before, he was a really good journalist, but he thought he was a really bad guy. Um, but one thing he talks about is like Rosenthal coming to him and asking, because uh, Siegel's portfolio included overseeing hiring at the copy desk. Do we have a lot of gay editors working here? I don't want gay editors here working here. And 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 Siegel said, I don't I don't really know. I don't ask them whether they can uh, whether they're gay or not. I'm more interested whether they know the difference between who and whom, which I don't, by the way. Um, it's not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> and then a moment later, according to this oral history, Punch Solzberger, who was Arthur's father, who was also, as you said, of another generation, walked in and sort of nodded in agreement to what he was saying. But that's the kind of stuff. I don't think there's any other way to get at between besides getting these kind of, you know, contemporary at the, these contemporaneous oral histories and documents like that. No, it, it, it's vital to your book. Um, I don't want to linger on, you know, generational failings and societal failings, but I do think the the topic of of how Rosenthal viewed gay people I think is is relevant in in other areas, and it's not just him, it's the entire paper uh, at various points, there was a lot of upheaval as the paper is going through what are broader societal changes, the civil rights era, mm -hmm. um, uh, the women's rights movement. Um, there was a lawsuit and a settlement involving women at the Times that I was unaware of until I read your book, and I'm hoping you can talk about its effect on the paper and, and the background of it. Yeah, it's a really interesting story. Um, in 19, I think it was 75, um, a group of women were talking to uh, Times executives about getting more representation of women. There, there was basically none, right? And I tell the story through a woman named Betsy Wade, uh, who was the paper's first woman news copy editor. And everything I've heard about her from meeting her at the time, I think, I think some people here knew her, she was a just an exceptional copy editor. She was just really smart. She wrote great um, headlines. And one example of it that I came across the Soulsburgers and and Arthur, uh, excuse me, and Abe Rosenthal asked her to edit the obituary of uh, so of um, Ifigenia Soulsburger, the sort of the you know the the uh, the wife of Punch Soulsburger, um, mother of Punch Soulsburger, and sorry about that, right, mother of, and that's a real high honor. So, but Betsy kind of led the the way on this, and she talks about uh, in her interviews with me and in other oral histories she gave. Um, she talks about working in this newsroom that was like all men. Like after six o'clock, it would only be men. And she told, like for example, one story that kind of illustrated the animosity she felt. Um, the paper used to allow spittoons in the newsroom, as disgusting as that sounds, Ugh. for people, men who chewed tobacco and spit them out to the. So they banned it, right? But this copy editor who's named in her in her in her oral history, I'm not sure I used. Oh, I did use his name in the book, but you can look it up. Um, would still come in with this big. <laughs> Remember cans of coffee like you, you can or Maxwell House? And he'd use that as his own personal spittoon. He'd walk past her desk at the end of the day, and he would swirl it around so she could smell it. It made her want to wretch, and she was sure she was being bullied. So that was so she, she puts her name first on this suit. So she's always identified with this suit. Um, and she's on the elevator one day with a man named Sidney Grusin, who was a senior editor at the paper. Again, I bet people here have heard of him. Senior advisor to Punch Solzberger, father of Arthur. And he turned to her by her account and said, you know, we're not in the process of promoting people who sue us. And Betsy, this, again, I think really extraordinarily talented editor, spent the rest of her career writing the Practical Traveler column, right? Now, I love the Practical Traveler column, but that is not the definition of success of the New York Times. To, to get to your, in a long-winded way, sorry to enter your point, a lot of women that I spoke to, Anna Quinlan, Susan Chira, said they would not have gotten their job at the Times were it not for this settlement uh, with women. And you saw a explosive, arguably not enough, I wouldn't say arguably, not enough, increase in representation of women in editing ranks and in reporting ranks. And I think it was a direct line to that suit. Um, other direct lines of change involve Arthur Selzberger. And you write a lot about how, um, and if I'm sorry if my, the mic drifts from my mouth, just yell that you can't hear me. Um, you write about his takeover as publisher. And, and Rosenthal and Punch Salzberger were hand in hand uh, in your description and an unusually close relationship and symbiosis. Uh, Arthur Salzberger takes over the paper and in your telling um, is eager to show the ways in which he is not his father. He offers, uh, or at least he engages in a, in a guild deal that has uh, same-sex domestic benefits, I yep. think. 
uh, which was a pretty big deal. Um, he uh, was very focused on rectifying some of the deficiencies, at least in terms of representation. But he also struggled uh, with two things. One is the the changing dynamics of a print newsroom and print as a force uh, nationally. And he struggled with choosing executive editors. And I'm hoping you can talk a bit about uh, the the two most identified, at least during that period, with him. And then and then and I mean I I want to pause by just opinionating for one yeah. second. You tell a, a story about Arthur Salzberger and struggles, but another way to look at it is that Arthur saved the paper, and I'm hoping that you can talk about both of those. I mean, you just answered the question better than I could. Oh, okay. So okay, well, now we're done then. <laughs> Good night, folks. You know, Arthur was, when I began this book, somebody, a, a colleague, said that one of your hardest tasks is going to be dealing with Arthur Solberger Jr., the legacy of Arthur Solberger. And this is 2016, so it wasn't that clear. He, here is a guy he's not as comfortable in his own skin as both his father and, in my opinion, his son. He's just kind of uh, goofy. This is coming to a compliment, by the way. Um, he oversaw two of the most traumatic moments in the history of the paper. He appointed and had to fire both Howell Raines and Joe Abramson. And in both cases, we can talk about their very high uh, skills and also flaws. Yeah, I want to talk the specifics wanna, of them yeah, at some point. But, yeah. but in both cases, that was his decision, and he got rid of them. But at the end of the day, um, I believe that Arthur Salzberger Jr., for whatever went wrong, his legacy is completely defined by the fact that he saved the paper. It was other people did it too, but he, in my opinion, gets the credit for moving the paper into, a, into the digital world. Again, I want to make clear he just oversaw it. He said yes. And I think that's a huge deal because if the, if the paywall had failed, if the digital paper had failed, I'd be up here trashing him, believe me, right? I think everyone would. Um, there, if I can quickly say, there's, in my opinion, there's two key things to keep in mind about him in terms of understanding that. One is that he began working for wire service. So he never had, as he was working his way up before he came to, to the Times, he never had the kind of fealty that you or maybe me or had to the idea of a morning newspaper and you're defined by your stories appearing in print. When you work for a wire service, your stories are posted, as we say now, as soon as they're done. The other thing, and this, this sounds flip, and I don't mean it flip, he was a Star Trek fan. He's a big sci-fi guy, right? So he would say, I don't care if we get the news into your head. We could beam the news into your head. I don't care what it is, right? And he was saying this not in 2016. I was finding him examples of him saying it like in 1996. I mean, a really, really long time ago. And I think he was the right, I would argue, that he was the right person for the time and the times. Pun intended. Who else besides... Arthur Salzberger had the greatest impact on the trajectory of the paper in the last 50 years, would you say, of everyone um, you wrote it's about? It's interesting. It, Besides the executive editors or including? Uh, no, including the executive editors. I mean, I I would have to say for sure Joe Lelyveld, even though he was in, my, in many ways the last of that kind of executive editor. Mm -hmm. I would have to say Dean Baquet. Um, we could talk about why he was the most recent executive editor until Joe Kahn took over. I would even weirdly argue how it rains, but we can talk about that too. And then a man, a couple of people, um, including a guy named Martin Niesenholtz, who was the head of the digital effort and really kind of pushed it. And then people that just aren't as well known. I mean, Richard Meislin was another one who's, because he moved to di digital later on. Lisa Tazi, right? People who just sort of like were there, were thinking in ways that the older men mostly were not thinking about and resulted in the paper changing as much as it did. Talk about the Reigns era. Talk about both why he was so impactful uh, on the trajectory of the paper, but also what you saw as the lapses and what you write about as the lapses. I mean, he came in, um, he came in intent to change the paper, right? He thought the paper was too slow. He thought it wasn't looking to the future enough. He thought it didn't have enough of a voice. And he really pushed people really hard. And six or seven days after he took over, uh, the, the World Trade Center attacks took place. And if you look at the coverage of that day, it's superb, and it really reflects him. And just like the stories and the ambition of it, but also the use of photographs, right? If you look at the front page that day, like I think two thirds of it is a picture of the World Trade Center um, falling down. That was a big deal. Um, I talked to one editor who talked about it. You, Usually at the paper, when you have editions, they'd have the meeting of editors between editions, and they're like, okay, 
What new stories do we have for the next edition? What are we going to throw out and what are we going to put in? And they would always throw out f photographs to make room for pictures, right? Excuse me, photographs to make sure for copy, make way for copy. And Howell Reigns goes, we're not going to do that because I think the paper should be very visual and we're going to keep those photographs and we'll figure out a way to get more copy in. And if you look back on it, in a way, that kind of presage is a sign of digital error. That, sorry for using words like presage. That's pretentious. But well, it you do work for the Times. <laughs> That's true. Um, um, you know, the, what the digital error is today, right? The idea of, like, it's not just words. It's also visual. And I think that was really important. The other thing, and again, this will be a little bit uh, long-winded, and I apologize for that, uh, in terms of why Howell, uh, I think, did not succeed. Um, after, uh, when... When Abe Rosenthal was executive editor, the newsroom was really cowed of him. People were legitimately afraid of dissent, of public dissent. You were, I mean, there was episodes of it, but you were in danger of being sent to, you know, I'm going to say West Chester because I work there, so I can put it down. Um, um, so th then when Max Frankel came in right, right afterwards, there was this episode, which I think, and I spent a lot of time on because I argue that it really changed the culture of the paper. He during the William Kennedy Smith rape trial down in West Palm Beach, West Palm Beach he wanted to name the, the accuser, the woman who, was, uh, who accused him of rape. And his argument was that, you know, Kennedy's a celebrity, um, she's an accuser. This, this is a kind of journalistic, I would argue, classroom exercise. I mean, we could talk about, you know, that of course you should do it to be fair. But it, it just doesn't work. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And it created a big uproar at the time. And he walked into the newsroom, and they had to call a town hall meeting of people who went up to the, whatever it was, the ninth floor where the auditorium was, and confronted him and not only, by name and yelled at him for doing this. And not only did this, some of them even talked to reporters from outside papers. And I, I think that's the beginning of when the newsroom became its own kind of force, when reporters were also part of the, not the management of the paper, but the culture of the paper in a more vocal way. Um, and there's a direct line to that after Howell took over, Howell Reigns took over. I don't think he appreciated that. And I think he was just like, we're going to go, we're going to do what we want to do. I don't care if people are in my way. We're going to run over them. And f for good reason. I mean, he wanted to have a good paper. But he didn't understand that you can't do that. So um, when the Jason Blair fabrications story happened, this involved a young man who was discovered to have fabricated dozens and dozens of stories. Is there but, anyone in this audience who doesn't know who Jason Blair is, just out of curiosity? Okay, I'm just, be, I'm I'm be, just, I'm just being careful. Yeah, just, don't, yeah. so we can sh 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 skip <laughs> over that. I just figured yeah. this, is a, Thank you. this is a high information form, right. group of people. Um, you know, the news went crazy because they felt like he, with justification, had promoted Jason's career, right, had ignored warning signs about him, and let him do what he did, and did something that damaged the paper for a long year, time. We could talk about that in a second, too. Um, and I think he just didn't have the support of the newsroom. He just, and he couldn't keep going because he didn't have the support of the newsroom. And I came, across, like, I came across Jason Blair's personnel file and memos between Arthur Sulzberger and, um, and Hal Raines when this is falling apart, and they're all really kind of upset. And it comes to a head in a meeting, excuse me, the editor, a lunch at the, in the, I think it was in the publisher's dining room upstairs, and, you know, they start, you know, a little bit touchy-feely, wants people to talk about what they're upset about with Howell. And Howell goes, I don't have to put up with this, and walks out of the room. And uh, um, Salzburger goes out and says, yes, you do, and pulls him back in. But Salzburger at that moment decided that this was over. And that night he called Joe Lellybelt and said, will you come back in and serve as temporary executive editor until I find someone else to replace him? So he just lost the newsroom. You know, after 9-11, he came in, he stayed at a hotel two blocks away. He walked in in the morning and like, um, he was like, every day was like, let's go, 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 go. We're going to get this story. Go, go. And he didn't, you know, I understand the instinct. I mean, I really, like the instinct, like this is a big moment. It's like what Maggie was saying at the top of, the, of this event. Like he wanted the paper to own the story. That's what the New York Times does. But I think he didn't understand that like, Reporters were exhausted. Reporters were also, and editors, sorry, were also, and photographers, were also experiencing this trauma, right? People were living in this city, which, as you obviously all remember, where you, it was a, felt like a war zone, right? The smell in the air and the smoke and the sirens. And I just think he didn't realize that or appreciate that or care. And I think that if he was here, I don't think he would argue with me at all. And that's why I think he lost his job. I don't think, sorry, Maggie. <laughs> no, no. I don't think that if Joe Lelybeld had been executive editor during this period, w w as traumatizing for the newsroom as it was for obviously all of us, I don't think he would have lost his job, even if Jason Blair had happened under him, in my opinion. Um, 
talk a bit about Jill Abramson, who was the first woman executive editor and one of the other uh, controversial executive editors you were mentioning, uh, who Arthur Salzberger picked. Uh, in what way did she differ from Reigns, just in terms of the difficulties that, that she had? Um, it, it's a you describe her her downfall essentially as as of her own making in the book, and I'm hoping that you can talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some similarities between them. They're different. They're, in my opinion, brilliant journalists with difficult personalities. The world was already changing when Jill Abramson took over, right? And I think she might have succeeded as an executive editor if she had gotten that job 10 years earlier, but there were new demands on her, and there were demands on working with business people and figuring out how do you reach audience, right? How do you write headlines to get more people? And she found herself doing stuff that she didn't think she was cut out to do, and probably wasn't good at, and didn't want to do. And she tells me in the book, like... Yeah, like what? Talk a little bit about um, what kind of thing you're talking about. But this, I mean, she says, I hate this job, right? So, like... There's scenes in there where like, people would go to her and, you know, this is like the life of being an editor now. They do a PowerPoint uh, presentation on, you know, how to reach suburban... I'm giving you a hypothetical, but I've seen stuff like this. How do we reach suburban male high-income voters? You know? And she would be like, I don't do PowerPoint, right? There's another point where she meets um, um, a man in the audience, right? And he's sort of involved in the sort of like crossing over between business and editorial and helping figuring out ways to reach more audiences. And Jill asks him what he does and he explains it. And he realizes that she's not really understanding what he's saying. So she goes to her, he goes, looks at her and he goes, Jill, I'm Switzerland, right? And Jill looks at him and goes, there is no Switzerland <laughs> and walks away. So I'm a, I'm a little um, resistant of the narrative that she like failed or destroyed herself. To some extent, I just think that she was in the wrong place. And to some extent, I think she was legitimately trying to save or protect institutions that she thought were under assault by this changing world. On the other hand, the world was changing, and I think Dean Becquet, her successor, realized it, and you had to figure out a way to work with it. To that end, talk a bit about what the Innovation Report is and talk a bit about A.G. Salzberger's appointment. I realize that he is not somebody who you spent excessive time on, but you do talk about him in the book. Yeah, so A.G. Salzberger starts at the paper as a reporter, and um, un, un, and this is one thing I could tell from being there. Un, I think, unlike his father, he was a hell of a reporter, right? Like, um, I came across one thing where, like, uh, an editor there wanted to give him a publisher's award. That's this internal thing that makes other people feel insecure. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, and he, AG said no, but he was a really good writer. And um, they made, they, Jill made him a, I forget the title now, a deputy whatever. And she asked him to be in charge of writing what was called the Innovation Report. She had been, uh, I almost said tasked with, sorry. She had been asked to come up with some kind of report to deal with the, by Arthur to deal with the digital changes that were going on. And I, you know, there's a part, part in it where someone who was an advisor at Jill says, let's put AG on this um, just as a way of waylaying him. Um, AG gets on it, right, and starts working on it and decides that the paper's future is at stake and they really have to figure out a way to rethink everything they do, rethink the presentation, rethink the future of the digital presentation, rethink eventually, it will lead to this, rethink how the paper makes money. And um, he writes this report and... It's worth going back to. It's a pretty comprehensive report. They put out a sanitized version for the public. Um, um, and then she looks at the unsanitized version. She's flying back from China uh, with Joe Khan, who's now the executive editor. And um, she looks at it, she reads it, and she told me, she thought to herself, I am, I can't use that this word, but it begins with F and ends with D. And um, it was pretty perceptive because she was, right? <laughs> and she was, she was, uh, she lost her job a little while later. Um, the unexpurgated version turned up in Politico, I think. It got leaked. You know, I never figured out. I never found in a way I could say definitively how it got out. But um, I think it was a pretty big step in the evolution of the paper from what it was when people here were growing up to what it is today. Um, one thing that I was struck by, just in terms of the substance of how the paper covers events, and I mean, we're, we're talking a lot about the things that that went wrong. There, there's a ton of things that have gone right in the in the papers. Uh, coverage uh, over a very long period of time, one of which, as you said, was the post-9-11 period. Yep. But there was another post-9-11 period, which was a very long hangover from what happened. And it shows up in various places in the book. It shows up 
in the Iraq war coverage. It shows up in the coverage of the Wen, uh, Wen Hali prosecutions. Uh, it shows up as the paper is navigating how to handle uh, processing and deciding how skeptically to treat what it's being told by the government, whether that is the White House or prosecutors. What was your takeaway from how the paper handled that? And do you think that anything has changed at the paper in how it how it deals with government and how it engages with government? Yeah, I think there was a real continuum here. And immediately after 9-11, you know, again, as I said before, everyone had lived through this. And there was this sort of feeling that we're all in this together and the paper was supposed to be patriotic and that, you know, if you write negative stories, you're helping, you know, the enemy. Sounds familiar, right? Um, so I think that editors were a little bit wary of being too leaning too much into some investigative stuff, and also as part of that, too believing of some of the stuff the government was putting out. In particular, as you mentioned, the weapons of mass destruction, WMD stuff that Judy Miller wrote about, which a lot of it turned out to be wrong, and it was one of the reasons, not the only one, I, I believe, but that we ended up going to war. Um, so that was pretty damaging. Um, that continues for a while, but you can see the paper after a while begin to get its confidence or its swagger and be less afraid of this. <clears throat> I think the period it was, when you really saw that, was Bill Keller, who was executive editor, was presented with a story, the NSA story, right? And he, um, after doing- That with, was the third one that I didn't mention. Right, and he, it was, it was brought to him by two reporters, and he um, he decided, to, he thought it was too damaging, he didn't- The story was about, um, surveillance on, on domestic residents. Um, right. and, and it was being held for a very long period of time. For 13 months, we yeah, figured, I think right? so, yeah. And, you know, Keller said that the reason he held it was because he didn't think they had proved, the two reporters, James Rice and Eric Lichtblatt, as I recall, right, yeah, yeah, had right. made their case that it was real. And 13 months later, he thought that they had proved it well enough to publish it. What a Pulitzer, as I recall, right? I I think, think so, yeah. Um, you use the word Pulitzer a lot in the book. I, I do, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's better than P P Publisher's Award. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> um, now listen, <clears throat> Keller will tell you, and he's a very credible guy, and he knows this stuff really well, that he became more convinced that the story was right, that those two guys had done more reporting and nailed it down. I think the atmosphere changed. I think that it, the sort of hangover of 9-11 was, was finally slipping away. And I'm sure you deal with it around, I don't mean to bring you into it, you deal with it from time to time in the newsroom, but it's nothing like it once was. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it is something, though, that I think is relevant at a moment when you have a former president under prosecution and you have the son of a sitting president facing Absolutely. prosecution. Yep. Um, there's one word um, that I only saw once in the text, you will correct right. me if I'm wrong, and it was Twitter. Right. Um, you, you very deliberately, and you talked about this before, you end the book at basically a 2016. You have a, a pretty intense epilogue. Um, Twitter uh, has been the, the bane of New York Times editors for a while now. Um, do you think that Twitter is something that has changed the way the Times engages with online and engages with news coverage? I do, but this goes to my other point, which is that I, I didn't want to try to tackle stuff that I think we don't really understand yet because we can't understand with time. And we, you can see how much Twitter has just changed over the past <clears throat> month with, with the war now, right, in terms of how significant and reliable it is. So I, I didn't deal with it at all because I didn't think that it was something I could write about in an intelligent way. If I, or more likely someone else, writes a sequel to this book, and I hope somebody does, and I hope if they do, they wait 10 years, I think we'll be able to understand, like, how important Twitter was, and was, or was it just kind of a passing sort of thing? Because I'm not really sure right now. But right now, obviously, it's a big deal in the newsroom. Um, to that point about the writing of the next phase of the history of the Times, how much did Gay Talese's book influence how you thought about your own? Um, so right after I got the contract, I went to Gay Talese's house. I'd never met him before. I knocked on his door. He opened the door and he said, I've been waiting for 15 years to write this book. So, and he invited me in and he showed me his Rolodex. You got, right, of course you know what that is, right? And, um, <laughs> and he actually sat down, this is a true story. He sat down and he said, okay, here's how you write the book. I'm not gonna try it, I can't do it. Like, it starts off like this and it's like a cold, dark night. You know, it's like, so he was very influential. He's a tremendous writer. God, I wish I could write half as well as he could, but. Um, so it influenced me in terms of 
wanting to bring the newsroom alive, wanting to bring the newsroom characters alive. It was important to me that it's not just a story about like egoistic, insecure, mostly brilliant people fighting. Because I think the stakes are really high. So I was trying to use my portrayals of these people, whether it's Max Frankel, Jill Abramson, um, to sort of Judy Miller, Jason Blair, to sort of help understand how the newsroom that is so important to this country operates. And I think that was what Gay Talib was trying to do with the newsroom he was writing about. Th there was one big difference between <clears throat> my book and his, besides the fact that he's Gay Talib, right? Um, I ended up having a narrative arc, right, that I stumbled into. I, when I first began the book, I didn't know how this book was going to end. For all I knew, the New York Times wouldn't exist, or at least would exist in a diminished uh, state. I didn't realize that it would unlock the, uh, un, un, unravel <clears throat> the question of how do you make money off digital uh, pro newspaper, and it did that. Um, and that's the big difference, I think, between me and him. Uh, how do you think A.G. Salzberger is doing as a publisher compared to his father and his grandfather? I'm going to leave that question to the next book. <laughs> I hope, that wasn't I hope you'll that, be writing it, and I'll get to read it. Yeah. Um, no, that wasn't because I think he's, it's just like I really... I, I, it's, uh, what I said before was absolutely honest. I just think... <clears throat> I don't think I would have understood this if I had talked to you guys in 2016, but I really do understand how important time is, how important perspective is, I had so much material I had to go through, and I included some, and I included other stuff, not included others, other stuff. And it's because I think I had the benefit of time, the candor of people who had left the paper, and again, all these documents. I have two more questions for you, and then we'll go to audience questions if that works. Um, they're both about they're both about power. I mean, one of the things that strikes me as I'm reading the story of of Abe Rosenthal and the transitions in the newsroom is how the New York Times was not. You know, it's a business. We are, you know, we are we are part of the fourth estate, but it's a business trying to survive, and that's the other story you tell. Um, how much of this story is basically about a a big company functioning in the United States during a time of enormous social transition? I mean, that is a big part of it, but <clears throat> but there's one of the key part, which is that it's a family owned business, right? And I think because of that, you know, Alex and Susan got at this in their book really well, but I think the Salzburgers are really genuinely dedicated to putting out a good newspaper. I think the family feels that its reputation is defined by the New York Times. And, you know, there's this old cliche, I, I think it was Abe Rosenthal who said it, um, you know, when we're in times of economic distress, we're going to do better by putting more tomatoes into the soup, by making the paper, the product, sorry to use that word, more valuable, by hiring more reporters. And you know, the Times did that. I think they did that because they're a family newspaper. Um, and, you know, you only see, you see cuts over the years. You don't see that many cuts in the newsroom. And when you do see cuts in the newsroom, it's because they want to use money to do something else. And I think that's the, that's the big difference right there. That's, I mean, it is a business, and it has to figure out a way to survive. And, again, that'll be a big part of the next book that you're going to write. Um, but, sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I just think, ultimately, the family thing is really, really important. I want to close on my questions with the, the one area of overlap between our books, mm -hmm. um, and it relates to a different uh, owner of a family business, which is Donald Trump. And you and I both have reporting uh, from, from different angles or different ends about the Trump and Abe Rosenthal relationship. And we both don't go into it at length. But um, you know, the, a criticism that Abe Rosenthal faced was that he was uh, sort of overly clubby, and that was something that... Mm -hmm. That, that existed a lot more, I think, in, in the 1980s and, and, and a certain social milieu. But Donald Trump was part of what, as I think you described it as his, his dinner party circuit, essentially. And I write in my book about a dinner that where Trump boasted about having gone to dinner with both Gay Talese and Abe Rosenthal and Shirley Lord, Abe Rosenthal's wife, um, who was friendly with or liked Ivana Trump. Um, and Trump was talking about this in a commencement address and sort of using it to bolster his own credentials. But looking back at the coverage of Trump in the paper in the 1980s, um, it often seemed to take him at his word, as everyone did, the Times was not alone in this, uh, that he was what he said he was in business. Um, do you think, and this is, I'm asking you a time machine question, so I fully acknowledge that, but do you think that there was any sort of a blind eye that Rosenthal may have had to looking more deeply at Trump because they dealt with each other socially? Um, I think the answer is yes. I'm going to give you an example off 
off point with someone else because I can't prove it. But what I did find was, as you did, I think, a number of letters between uh, Trump and Salzburger, excuse me, Trump and actually Salzburger too, Trump and Rosenthal, Rosenthal. which were really, you know, buddy buddy. At one point, I think Rosenthal signed one of them, Love, and like he, Trump signed it. Love. Trump signed it, Love, and um, you know, he, Trump had dinner at his apartment and. You know, Rosenthal wrote a letter complaining that he had been mistreated at Trump Tower, and Trump was like, that will never happen again, promise him that. So it was a little bit kind of creepy. You never know how that works into the newsroom because those are often private conversations between ambitious editors and, you know, executive editors who pick up on what's being said. Um, I did find one example of it uh, with Mort Zuckerman. Um, Mort Zuckerman was profiled by a reporter named Jane Perlez, and after he built the building at Columbus Circle, and she wrote what Zuckerman thought was a snarky story about him. You, you can go back and look. I don't think it was, even though maybe that's just me. You shouldn't trust me. But I thought it was a perfectly legitimate story. And um, he sent uh, Rosenthal like a list of seven objections to the story. And so Rosenthal decided that it needed an editor's note. An editor's note was different than a correction. An editor's note is when... And still is. And still is, yeah. It, that he, Rosenthal started these things, and they're, I guess they're more intense than a correction. because They're it says, a little punitive. I mean, they are punitive, yeah. yeah. You don't want an editor's note. You just don't. And he, um, and he, went, to a, he went to Al Siegel and said, I want to do an editor's note about this. Side note, Siegel was like, I could not stand when he came to me. He would want an editor's note about... Zuckerman and I think Kissinger, like he felt like he was abusing this thing, but whatever. So he wrote an editor's note, right? And, um, you know, sort of saying the story was not fair or whatever. And then, um, you know, the Washington Post got wind of it and called up and Abe Bozenthal goes, ah, just, it's just a thing. I don't really know, way, you know, Mort Zuckerman. Who's Mort Zuckerman? Who is anyone else? You know, he's no one to me. So then I'm going through Abe's papers, right? And there's his personal note he's written to Mort Zuckerman says confidential at the top, confidential at the bottom. Said, I think it said eyes only. Eyes yeah. only, right? Like, what is, what is this? Like, so, and then he says, um, you know, I just I did want you to know, you probably saw this story in the Washington Post. By, I think it was by Eleanor uh, 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 Randolph, who came to work at the paper eventually. Um, he said, I don't, don't read it the wrong way. Like, what I'm saying is, like, I clearly know you. I would do whatever you want. You're Morty. You're my good friend. I would do it again. And I just think, I looked at that and I thought, well, this is a kind of minor example of it, but there was probably more examples of it that, unfortunately, he didn't think of writing a letter to memorialize it about it, to make it provable. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to turn to questions now. Um, there are microphones at the back. If you raise your hands, I will call on you um, if anyone has questions. If not, that's so easy. We will go and we'll go upstairs. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> you couldn't save this till after. Okay. Your hand. Um, your book's great. Um, Thank you. I, I, I've read it, um, of course. But the, um, how do you, when you use 2023 eyes to evaluate 50 years ago, where, which makes you an historian, perhaps not going as far back as Abraham Lincoln as others here, but, um, <laughs> but no, but I mean, is it fair to use 2023 eyes on 1977, let's say, when attitudes about gays, minorities, women, and so on would be different? It's, it's just, so to what degree, in, as you were writing it and reporting it and writing it, do you weigh weigh that factor in there? That um, that the, do you use twenty twenty three eyes, or do you sometimes use nineteen seventy seven eyes? I I didn't realize this at first, Clyde, but I did realize it at a certain point, and I realized that you can't use twenty twenty three eyes, or at that point it was twenty nineteen eyes, to evaluate stuff that happened at the time. And I try not to be judgmental in the book as much as just sort of rolling it out there. Um, there might be times when I found language so harsh that it, and discordant uh, you know, that was said at the time that it, maybe I wouldn't use it just because I think it wouldn't work or be fair to the person. So I, the problem is you need to, I think the best way to deal with it is just sort of lay it out there. I don't, like for example, the Abe Rosenthal thing before, like I don't talk about Rosenthal being a homophobe. I use those quotes from him and like you can just kind of draw your own conclusions. And I, I agree that perhaps it's, you know, it was sort of in keeping with the morals of the time. And 
I think I even say at certain points that like they reflected um, Abe and Punch Sulzberger reflected society the way it was at the time. So I'm less likely to be judgmental of them. I mean, there's probably some people who will read it and think I should have been more judgmental of them. I'm more likely to just step aside and let the facts sort of speak for, th for themselves. So, but that, I just want to say that's a great question that I, I didn't think of until I was into the research on it and came, was coming across stuff that I was like, well, you know, at the time, this might not seem so bad, so you know, but I still wanted to sort of include it in the book. That's a very good question. Yes. I'm Michael Myers, I'm the president of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. My question is about A.M. Rosenthal. I remember him very well. I remember him, he went from the New York Times to become a columnist for the New York Daily News. My question to you is, was he really pushed out, or was it because of the 65 and you're out retirement rule? And wasn't there any, any option that the New York paper, newspaper had to keep him beyond the 65? Absolutely. The 65 retirement rule is just like, it's just one of those things they guys question. pluck out from, excuse me, pluck from the air. Like, it doesn't exist in paper. Now people say it exists, and sometimes it's when you turn 65, sometimes it's at the end of your 65th year, sometimes it's when you're 68, as, was, as it was with one of Rosenthal's predecessors. So I think in that, I don't think, I know in that case that Punch Sulzberger used that as a pretense to get rid of him. You'll read in this book where, um, if you get a chance to read it, where Sulzberger, who had thought that Rosenthal was a great editor for so long, who was so close to him, who had done so many great things for him in the paper, just realized the guy, the guy had to get out. He had to get rid of him. And so he used the 65 thing to push him out and to give him that column. So yeah, I, I absolutely, yeah, I, I don't think the 65 thing was just whatever the polite way of saying BS is. Arbitrary. Arbitrary, thank you. <laughs> Most of us here are New Yorkers, and many of us sorely miss the Times coverage of local news in the city, local political news, mm -hmm. uh, the loss of the metro section, the loss of many great columnists. So uh, I don't know whether this was part of the Innovation Report. I haven't read the book, let, book yet, but could you please comment on the decision-making at the Times that led them to pretty much abandon what I think is important local, honest local news coverage in New York City? Um, one thing I would say is, you know, I started my career at the Times. I first came and covered Bob Dole when he ran for president in 1996. But after that, I was the, the Metropolitan Political Reporter, right, I, for six years or five years. I, I loved working in New York. I loved covering New York. I loved the Metro section. I would be lying if I told you that my heart wasn't broken when the metro section was uh, eliminated. Um, two things. One is, I, I'm now I live out in Los Angeles, so I don't see the metro coverage enough to know how good it is. I do know that I see some really terrific reporters and terrific stories. I don't know if it's as good as it was back when I was doing it, but it was really good. And the sort of the more um, baseline or the more thirty thousand foot answer to your question is that the New York Times is definitely appealing more to a national audience. And you know, we can talk about whether that means cutting off New York or not. I, you know, I'll probably avoid that. You can ask AG when he's here. But it, that's part of what's going on. They're, they're reporting. They're, it's a national newspaper now. And one of the things I didn't mention with Arthur Sulzberger Jr. that he did, which I think was really important from a financial point of view, was that he said, we're going to make this a national paper. Um, the paper now has more digital subscribers um, in California, I'm almost sure about this, than in New York. I mean, you know, that's just the way things are. Uh, the one thing I want to, again, I want to emphasize to you, since I'm not here, when I read the paper online, I do see lots of great metro, I won't ne mention any names, but political, uh, uh, political and metro stories coming out of here in Albany. And, I mean, the Times knocked out two governors, right? Like, that's, I mean, that's Yeah, one, one story. Not for nothing. You, you raised an, a, a topic that we were, we were going to touch on, but we just ran out of time. Um, but but one one story that you tell in the book that sort of is a segue into the, the digitalizing of the paper is about the tip that Willie Rashbaum, our colleague, got about Elliot Spitzer and the investigation at Elliot Spitzer. And the paper led the way. Um, I think there's a, a 
Pulitzer winner in the audience who was part of that coverage, actually. Um, and the uh, we were talking about Pulitzers, um, but uh, but it was it was a huge moment for the paper, and, and it was hardly the paper slouching on local coverage. To your point, so. and that, just if I could just back up a little bit to talk about another point. Um, the paper has a lot of sort of intrigue and you know dark stuff and wacky people and stuff. But the New York Times is a cool place to work, and I didn't want it to use the sort of like noble and sort of, I don't want to say you take joy out of it because who takes joy out of 9-11? But I think that people, it's a, you, you don't work there for the money. <laughs> you know, you work there because covering stuff is really cool. And I hope that that comes across. The Elliot Spitzer story, which I outlined in there, but I, I use the point to make the, how digital has become more important because they post that story right during the day. Um, the 9-11 uh, story, the, the Challenger explosion, those are all really big coverage. And to bring this whole session back to where we started, I think probably over the next couple of days we'll see the coverage out of the Mideast. It's what the New York Times does. And through all the Michigas, do I have to translate that? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, that's what makes the New York Times the New York Times. And, and it's why we are fortunate to work there. And I think we're getting the hook. So. And it, well, it's why we're fortunate to have both of you to talk about this book. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we have a glasses of wine to toast Adam upstairs, and most important of all, we have the book for you to purchase and get inscribed. So please join us for the reception, and thank you.